Okay, thanks, Scott. And uh, would like to thank also the organizers for inviting me to speak. And uh, most also would like to thank our guest speakers who are here as well. They for traveling the distance. Uh, for me, I live here just across the road in South Street, so it took me only five five minutes to walk. <laughs> so um, I'll uh, be speaking about uh, treatment options, although at first I'll touch a little bit uh, on the diagnosis briefly and symptoms as they were very well covered by Dr. Dussal, but I'll go quickly over these things. These are my disclosures. So. This is a slide that I like to present when I talk about patients who have monoclonal uh, disease. So basically, this comes from lymphocytes, B lymphocytes, or type of white blood cells, okay? They're polyclonal. They are multiple colors that you see at first. <clears throat> and then they develop mutation, then become a monoclonal. One of them becomes abnormal and start populating. As you see, the red cells that are growing there. So it's all polyclonal at first, multiple colors. And then one cell comes, it's a bad cell, then start growing, producing the M protein. This is the bad protein that manifests the disease later on. So and the way of diagnosis this is what we call serum protein ectophoresis. The picture far in there, it shows the graph there, it shows the normal serum protein ectophoresis. So if you see that this, there is no spikes there, okay? It's all of the normal, okay, polyclonal. And then when patients, they develop those monoclonal cells, the red blood cells, that they, sorry, they, these red monoclonal cells, they are the ones that produce the monoclonal protein, which when we do the serum protein to phoresis, it shows me this, the monoclonal protein going up. So that's how it all starts. As mentioned, uh, there is, this is a type of non-Hodgkin lymphoma and mingles also with, bald and also with plasma cell dyscrasia or multiple myeloma. So, but as lymphoblastic lymphoma in the marrow manifestation, this is considered an indolent lymphoma, a slow-growing process, slow-growing disease. Patients, they can have many years and disease progress before they have symptoms or needing treatment. <clears throat> These diseases falling on the category of indolent are slow and also, unfortunately, we call patients them is not curable. It's treatable, but not curable. And patients have no symptoms. They don't need treatment. We'll just sit tight and watch those patients. <clears throat> so the Waldenstrom has basically, if you want to split it, we can maybe say two components, the bone marrow, the lymphoplasmacytic lymphoma, and outside the marrow is the M protein. And the symptoms of the disease can be based on these two components. <clears throat> now, to mention a little bit of demology here in Nova Scotia, as uh, Dr. Dussal mentioned earlier, that it's, it's a rare disease, it's about 1% uh, patients. We looked at our patients in Nova Scotia between 2002 to 2007 and to try to see the uh, incidence of lymphoblastic, all lymphomas, including lymphoblastic lymphoma, okay, and we know that's about 5% of non Hodgkin lymphoma to be a lymphoblastic lymphoma. And when we compare this to the WHO book, which is the international uh, incidence, okay, showing the lymphoblastic lymphoma in the WHO book is about 1.4% as compared to Nova Scotia between 2002-2007 is about 5%, a little bit higher. When I was a resident here about eight years ago, I was talking to Dr. McDonald always to say, I feel those patients are actually far more here based on what we see. Like, I feel it's more than 1%. So this study showed me this is actually we reviewed this and we looked and actually it shows about 5% of our patients. <clears throat> so again, it's a rare disease, some a little bit more male predominance, okay? And familiar proposition has been described in about 20%. Etiology, uh, we look at a few things, but most of the time we don't have a good explanation as why this disease has developed. Okay, uh, sometimes you just say it's bad luck. Okay, uh, so infections as hepatitis C virus have shown that it can 
increase the risk of uh, wild and stroke. <coughs> and we always test our patients in that time diagnosis for viral infections. Uh, so, clinical presentations for those uh, uh, patients, okay. As I said, majority of patients, they can be asymptomatic as a start, okay. And then the presentation will be uh, based on either the bone marrow infiltration or the M protein. And the bone marrow infiltration, uh, this patient can have fatigue, having fever, sweats, or chills. These are what we call the B symptoms, okay. It's possible patients who are, we're watching, waiting them, they might have these symptoms once a month or once every few weeks, okay, for a couple of days, then goes away. <clears throat> this is not an indication for us to start treating and say, just best sit and watch. Uh, I have Dr. Orm Hainsey, or one of the, our senior hematologists, he always tells me, these diseases, they wax and wane. Just sit tight and watch and see them, okay. So it's always good to sit down and watch. The fever sweats for a couple of days, uh, usually settles and see how patients go. <clears throat> the bone marrow infiltration, okay, as these lymphoma cells increase, okay, the other cells go down, meaning the healthy cells, okay. So if the lymphoma cells increase, you might have your red blood cells production goes down, so the hemoglobin goes down, so your energy goes down. And our guidelines say if patients have hemoglobin less than 100, those ones, we would treat them. The hemoglobin range, we use a normal range between 120 to 160. However, we say if patients for this disease, if they are symptomatic, having fatigue, hemoglobin less than 100, we treat them. <clears throat> I have a patient, I remember a couple of years, he was referred to me by, him, by his family physician for a hemoglobin of 90, okay? Did a blood work and did the workup bone marrow biopsy and then confirmed lymph plastic lymphoma. He tells me, I don't know why my family doctor sent me. I was going to do a routine blood work and he told me, no, you have to go and see a hematologist. And he says, I am active, I have no fatigue, and actually I'm cycling quite close to 50 kilometers a week. So, okay, I don't do that. So, him, his hemoglobin was around 90. So, okay, our guidelines tell you to treat those patients. I, said, I think it's best just to watch and see. So again, to emphasize this, looking at numbers, it was not the most important thing, is the patient, how they're doing is what we do. <clears throat> okay. And then large lymph nodes, uh, and also large liver and spleen, uh, those can cause also symptoms. The lymph nodes, is there a need to follow up routinely those patients and watch them and see how big by imaging? No, it's best just to monitor because ideally the indication for treating based on the lymph nodes if the lymph node is like 10 centimeter, a bulky lymph node have no symptoms, those guys will treat. And very unlikely to have a patient have a given lymph node at 10 centimeter and have no symptoms. <clears throat> the manifestation or presentation due to the monoclonal protein, it can be in hyperviscosity. Basically, you see in the picture on the side, uh, this agglutination of the cells, okay, well, plus IgM there. This would lead to sluggish flow of blood, okay? Uh, if it's in the head, sluggish flow, then you'll have headaches, okay? If it is a sluggish flow around the eyes, then you'll have blurry vision, you can't see, you can't double visions, okay? So this is what we call hyperviscosity. The blood flow is kind of difficult to go through the vessels, <coughs> okay? Uh, cold agglutinin, basically hemolyzing and leading the hemoglobin to go down. This basically is not like the hemoglobin going down because blood cells in the marrow are not produced enough. Sometimes those patients you might do a bone marrow, you find, yes, they have disease, but not significant. But you look on their smear, actually, it's very hemolyzed. They destroy this blood cells, leads to anemia, so they get tired and fatigue. Then those patients, they would need treatment. I manifest neuropathy uh, also as a part of it. And cryoglobinemia, and the last is amyloidosis, which is a different disease entity, but can be associated with uh, lymphocytic uh, lymphoma. <clears throat> so these are percentages uh, for the symptoms, uh, basically ranging all between 20 to 30% uh, in those patients when they present uh, either one of these uh, manifestations I mentioned. Uh, findings can be seen as uh, mentioned the hyperviscosity, uh, having uh, Raynaud's uh, changes, having 
the hypervascosity either central nervous system or on the eye changes. So we have the a investigation and workup uh, varies. We start basically after we see the patients, assist them, take a history from them, and to do a physical exam, then this would direct me further to do the investigation and what to investigate, okay? Simply we start with a CBC, and uh, look for the blood counts, okay? And then this would direct me more if I need to do, like if the, if the complete blood work count is normal, but patients has an IgM, okay? and they're doing fine, I don't need to go in all the way to do a bone marrow biopsy at that visit. I'll sit tight and say, yes, you do have monoclonal protein, <clears throat> and this is a, would be a diagnosis of Waldenstrom, and now it's domestic, or it could be IMGAS even, and now we sit down and watch. We don't have to go all the way to do a bone marrow from the first visit. Because sometimes what happens here, there are patients who are going to get a CT scan for any other reason, okay? And then they find a lymph node in those patients, they get a lymph node biopsy that turned out to be a Waldenstrom or lymphoblastic lymphoma. Do we need to go and do further investigation, do the bone marrow to confirm if the CBC is normal and the patient has no symptoms and don't need to treat? Might hold off and tighten watch this patient. <laughs> uh, so the testing has been CBC, kidney function, liver function, always good to have as a baseline, and basically serum protein interferases, and then the bone marrow biopsy, and afterward, it depends if there's evidence of, as I said, hemolysis of blood destruction, then we do the hemolysis workup. <clears throat> also, a uh, CT scan if needed in the bone marrow. And uh, the last thing, if there's evidence or concern, this patient might have amylodosis, and we do a fat pad biopsy. Not routinely, we do fat pad for old patients. And ophthalmic evaluations or vision, we send our patients here to ophthalmologists uh, if they come concerned. Uh, with some blurry vision or have concerns that there could be a hyperviscosity. As a part of the workup, if we have a definite at the time presentation, this patient have hyperviscosity and have high IgM, we know this well doing stroma and this hyperviscosity, we start treating as, and then ask the ophthalmologist to see the patient to assist further. <clears throat> so autoimmune hemolysis is basically secondary to uh, this IgM, those patients, we might have patients who are presenting, the only main issue is hemolysis. They're hemolyzing, they're destroying red blood cells, so we need to address that. I wouldn't go in details here, molecular uh, biology, but they're, f as treatment advancing, also luckily the investigations and confirmatory testing we have are advancing as well and improving. And MYD88 is a molecular testing, it's uh, associated with a higher percentage, more than 90% of patients of Waldenstrom with blood lymphoma. And luckily here we have access to do this testing sometimes because when we do a lymph node biopsy, sometimes it's hard to confirm what type of lymphoma it is. So luckily now we have access to do MYD88 testing to confirm. <coughs> also the CXCR4 uh, as well mutation. So these are associated with Waldenstrom and we do sometimes need these testing to confirm uh, our diagnosis. So, treatment, uh, does everyone need treatment at diagnosis? It's always hard when a patient comes to me first visit, we sit down and chat and give them the information and okay, so what is this disease you're talking about? When I say cancer, basically if you wanna go and look at liver, this is actually truly cancer, because cancer is, there is a cell that's changed, produced abnormal shape, and is not doing its function right. That's cancer. So if you ask me what it is, I tell it cancer, then, okay, doctor, you tell me it's cancer and you want me to go home and forget about it. It's hard, right? <laughs> so I tried first to see those patients the first. Uh, I know it's hard to gather all the information, so I see them again the following few weeks, then again in a few months. Then as patients learning more and grasping more information and they know, they understand that they're not symptomatic and we know what we're watching, uh, then we slow down on the follow-ups depending on how their blood work and how is everything going, okay? So there are evidence. So the other question, okay, this, you tell me I have cancer. It's a small amount. Why don't you blast it and get rid of it? So then this is it. We're happy and living fine. There, there are many studies that shows 
that no, there is no need to advance and start. And actually, sometimes the treatment can be uh, harmful more and side effects as compared to not treat. <clears throat> so the study basically shows here uh, patients followed over 10 years, okay? And if you see, let me just show it clearly, if you see that around between the 40 and 60% of 50%, those patients, they took almost three years or more to decrease from there, from the start, from zero time, all the way to three years, 50%. So we have in three years, almost 50% of your patients uh, needed treatment, okay? And then if you go to 10 years, okay, you have almost 10% of the patient had not been treated yet. So almost 10 years. So, yeah, asking the patient, like, a, in 10 years now, would you want to take treatment now, side effects, or maybe in 10 years you would be still living fine and never need treatment? So there is evidence to show us that those patients can do well. <coughs> so it's best always watching and waiting. <coughs> so we talked briefly about the indication of treatment, say, B symptoms and lymphadenopathy, splenomegaly, the cell counts, as I said earlier, but still, the, these are as an indication for us as doctor, but sometimes, as I said, I have been mad and saying, patient looks fine, so I just want to sit tight and watch and see also if this truly declining more or not. The hemoglobin is less than 100, we <coughs> use platelets less than 100 <coughs> due to the infiltration, or patients who have hyperviscosity, those guys will treat them, okay? Uh, neuropathy or also renal impairments as well. Amylate doses, if they are developing amylate doses, then those patients also need treatment. So, we need to look at treatment strategy for those patients, depending what kind of symptoms that brought them in and what to address first is in treatment, okay? If a patient at first were watch and wait, but now they're progressing, starting having symptoms. They're having symptoms due to the IgM, the monoclonal protein, as in having hyperviscosity, okay, then those patients will need plasmapheresis first. However, this plasmapheresis is just like a dialysis machine. They're hooked to a machine, blood goes in and goes out, and you filter this IgM. So when you filter this IgM, you don't filter the cells that are making the IgM, okay? So I clean, this is basically almost like a Band-Aid. I'll fix it this way, but the problem in a few weeks is going to start rising again. So this is, but it is as a start treatment to, to avoid this emergency. Now, the hyperviscosity situation, we look at it as an emergency situation. We need to plasmapherese those patients. <clears throat> so this is the one strategy, is plasmapheresis. And then the other strategy is that the cytoreductive, we call it, or cytoreduction, Basically, side two, as cells, we need to reduce these cells, okay? Give treatment to reduce their cells down, okay? These monoclonal plasma cells, we need to calm down. And unfortunately, we don't have yet treatment that to knock them all out. We need to reduce them as much as we can. <clears throat> and then the last, after you reduce them, you need to maintain those patients then. So we have maintenance therapy as well. So before starting the therapy, uh, there's always a question to ask if patients, this is the first day we meet, or this patients came to the emergency and this is the first day we meet, okay, as patients come in with hyperviscosity symptoms or not, and how high the IgM. It's true with 100%, there's no correlation 100% with the level, though the hyperviscosity is the most important. If patients have hyperviscosity symptoms, we would uh, uh, treat with plasmapheresis before the treatment with tri uh, other uh, drugs. Now, how about if the patient has a high IgM already, but they don't have a hyperviscosity symptoms, what we do in our practice here in our center, especially in say, is that we try to uh, do plasmapheresis to decrease their IgM, okay, before we start cytoreductive. Because we have some concerns, especially now we use rituximab, we'll go after it later on, <coughs> It can flare up this IgM a little bit higher at the start, uh, then goes down. So we try for those patients to take a little bit off plasmapheresis first. Uh, so we talked about the hyperviscosity symptoms. So just to find this picture is a bit quite interesting online, just 
to see the changes for those patients who have hyperviscosity and gorge vessels on the far end there before plasmapheresis, how it is, and then after plasmapheresis, it's the blood flow becomes better, the visual acuity becomes better for those patients. <laughs> okay. So here's the thing. When we talk the first time, we say there's treatment, some patient might go online, have a look. There is a long list of medications you can say this we can use for treatment of uh, patients who have Waldenstrom. Okay, so to divide them in categories, alkylating agents, uh, I'll say the bendamustine is alkylating uh, purinol alog as well. So uh, bendamustine is one of the drugs, cyclophosphamide, chlorambicil, malphalan, and then purin alogs, we have the fludarabine, pentostatin, fludarabine. <coughs> And then there's the new drugs, the monoclonal antibodies. We have rituximab, avatumumab, and there are more new drugs as well uh, coming. Bortezone inhibitors, uh, uh, this is like bortezomib or Valcade, and also the new drug also we use mainly for treatment of myeloma is carfilzomib. And then the uh, brutinib, uh, brutin kinase inhibitor, and then emid as well, linonamide and thalidomide. This is what we call them immunomodulators. So it's, it's a very long list of medications here to see. <coughs> and just before I talk about each treatment, and then I say what our guidelines here and how we built our guidelines, just to mention, what are our goals from the treatment, okay? Or what is the uh, monitoring response for, for those patients? So our goal for patients who need treatment is what we call remission. And remission, as we say, is not cures. Remission is the disease the lowest uh, possible can be with treatment. So it can be a complete remission, uh, what we'd like to get for those, <clears throat> is basically disappearance of the monoclonal protein on testing, serum protein interface and immunofixation. So when we do this protein level, we look for it, we don't find it at all. So this is complete remission. And very good partial remission, okay? Those patients, they have at least 90% of the level, okay? Um, then partial remission of those patients having 50% reduction of the level. And then some patients, they might have a minor response, 25%. Uh, stable disease, yes, unfortunately, there are some drugs we try, Patients' uh, disease or IgM level and lymph nodes, they stay the same. They do not improve. Progress disease, basically further increase of the, uh, the disease by 25%. And this is, we look at it, either if they are relapsed, like if they were remission, then they got treatment, they are in remission, then now relapsing. So we look at 25% increase, okay? Or if they are in treatment already, but they are unfortunately still progressing despite therapy. So 25% is the number we look at. So treatment has been evolving over many years, okay? Start was the alkylating agents and purine analogs from 1980s. Chlorambicil, it was the oldest to start with. <coughs> and also cyclophosphamide, uh, either in a uh, single agent or then becoming as a uh, combination uh, therapies as well. Uh, we st still tend to use sometimes the chlorambicil here, patients who are not able to tolerate other drugs we might go to as a last resort or try it as well. The purine analogs, uh, fludarabine, uh, this showed a very good response uh, uh, in treating Waldenstrom, although it has a toxicity, very high side effects. <clears throat> the response in treatment can be up to 90% So has been looked at between the chlorambicin and fludarabine, and the chlorambicil response rate was about 36%, uh, uh, and basically for fludarabine was higher, 48%, progression-free survival of 36% for those patients. <coughs> and that study showed the fludarabine that was higher than chlorambicil uh, response. <coughs> Toxicity, uh, so uh, basically it can be from secondary cancers, those patients also in uh, treatment, they can transform uh, as well. <clears throat> and as I mentioned earlier, we reserve this option as a last option 
and as we don't have any alternative and for patients who are unfit and elderly. So the uh, fludarabine, as I mentioned, is toxic drug. Uh, we are less and less using it now for patients who have relapsed Weldon and Strom with the newer agents coming in. Um, the short-term effect or issues with it is that it can cause uh, white blood cells and neutrophils can go very low, and these are the cells that help fighting infections. And the problem with that, all our therapies, they may decrease and go back up, but fludarabine can cause a a uh, slightly prolonged, what we call neutropenia, so patients can be at a higher risk of infections. And those patients, usually we, we give them fludarabine, we always give them a prophylactic antibiotics to go on while they're on treatment and afterward for a year. The uh, long-term effect from fludarabine, also secondary malignancies as possible. Uh, in six years, it's made to be 3.7, and also transformations. <coughs> Then in the 2000s, that's when the treatment has changed dramatically with the arrival of the uh, monoclonal antibodies. And mainly speaking about the uh, rituximab, which is an NTC20 antibody. Uh, so this start first in 1997, when it trials then uh, start fast uh, moving forward until becoming um, the first line of treatment. And one of the studies in rituximab clearly improves outcome in patients with uh, endodontal lymphomas, basically when it's combined with, uh, our, uh, with other modalities of our CHOP, and shows that patients who had rituximab, if you see the line in the higher up, that's rituximab plus CHOP, okay, therapy, and shows patients did much better than patients who had CHOP alone down below on the orange line. <coughs> so this has been our first line therapy here for a while. As you give to RCHOB or RCVB uh, to similar regimens, we use them for those patients who have Waldman's Um There has been evidence to showing also a single agent uh, rituximab, okay? And I showed now this is combined, either RCHOB or CHOP alone, but then also there are multiple trials, trials or studies showing that rituximab alone as a monoclonal antibody can give an effect on treating <coughs> patients with Walden Strom. Uh, so unfortunately here, access to as a single agent, which is interesting sometimes to look at, you cannot get your toximab alone, okay? We need a combination therapy. We have it approved for us as a combination therapy. We look sometimes, we have patients that are in 85 years of age and feel, okay, combination chemotherapy can be a little bit hard on those patients, okay? So what we try, the other regimens that we haven't listed in our uh, guidelines here is to use lower of these, and basically this is RCD, which is rituximab, cyclophosphamide, and dexamethasone. So this is still tolerated, and we have access, can get this way and do it for our patients. <clears throat> so I mentioned a little bit earlier that patients who have high IgM and we are gonna give them treatment with monoclonal antibody that are toximab. We watch and worry about the flare-up uh, of uh, their IgM, uh, and this is actually all proven in studies, <coughs> and we do plasmapheresis for them. Sometimes when the immunoglobulin is, is not, uh, like it's a borderline <coughs> high, what we do is just give a first cycle, especially sometimes it's hard to arrange the plasmapheresis uh, within like a couple of weeks or a time and manner for this patient to start chemo, we might give the first cycle without the rituximab. We hold rituximab back. We give uh, our standard other rest of the regimen in order to lower a little bit the tumor burden. Then we go and add the rituximab to the following cycles. <clears throat> so these are other regimens, as I mentioned, our CVP and uh, RCD or DRC. Uh, and just briefly to mention here, there, the, the studies showing the response rate for the purinol log, so as in combination between rituximab and fludarabine. Uh, we used it uh, mainly in relapsed refractory patients as well, so it does show there is response, okay? But the biggest concern also for this regimen, either FCR or FR alone, 
is the risk effects. <coughs> now, then a new drug came in, okay, uh, which is the bendamustine, okay. It has similar cheesing structure between alkylator and purine analog, okay, and meaning like the cyclophosphamide <coughs> and clodiripine. So bendamustine is a very good drug, okay, and has been studied and looked at patients who are getting, as I mentioned, that we were giving ARCHOB or RCVB as our first line, and then their trial came and showing between patients who get bendamustine rituximab compared to the ARCHOB. As you see, the blue line is the ARCHOB, our previous therapy, and the red line is the bendamustine rituximab, which is now becoming our standard of care here. <coughs> and you say time in months, so the BR given longer uh, time in months compared to the ARCHOB, okay? <coughs> and then it's basically 69 months compared to 28. <coughs> So, since then, since the study here in Canada, and talk specifically our center, is that it's as a first line therapy for patients who are fit to get treatment, as we give them is bendamustine and rituximab. We give it six cycles. Okay, first cycle, usually a cycle start day one, we give rituximab plus the bendamustine, and day two, we get bendamustine. And every six, six, sorry, every 28 days, we repeat the cycles for a total of six cycles. <coughs> the good thing about this regimen is compared to the R job, it's the toxicity is less, and basically there is uh, no hair loss with it. Nausea can be a little bit more, but we have good supportive therapy that helps with it. Now, after we finish the six, uh, cycles of treatment and reevaluate those patients, okay? As I mentioned, the responses we're looking at best to be a CR. Most important is that uh, patients can be a very good uh, response or, or partial response. What I look mostly is that did the symptom that the patient had before starting go or not, okay? That's the most important success here. If it is gone, then yes, we are on to step two and patients is in at least uh, in the partial remission. <coughs> Then we'd go afterward on the maintenance of Tuximab. So, okay, there are studies. <coughs> Waldenstrom is not a very common disease. So uh, to have a big study to show the efficacy and evidence of, uh, of the maintenance or any of the studies is hard. So most of the studies we find they are actually included with patients who have uh, other types of lymphoma as well. <coughs> but overall, Maintenance of Tuximab, it shows for indolent lymphoma, those patients, they do well and they have a, a longer progression-free survival as compared to patients who do not get the maintenance. So, and from that, and uh, treatment approach for patients who have Waldenstrom lymphoblastic lymphoma here across Canada, as a first line, is looking for patients who are uh, younger and fit, is uh, bendamustine and rituximab as a first-line therapy. That's what we use here in our center, okay? And then following that, we have also access to give rituximab for maintenance for two years. And the last changes we have here in our center is that now rituximab is we give it as sub-Q, subcutaneous injections. So those long hours of coming to the medical day is less now. So patients come, get a sub-Q, 15 minutes, and they go home. So we, we have applied this change to <coughs> patients with indolent lymphomas, basically. Patients who are elderly, unfit, basically, then we uh, see chlorambicil as an option, okay? Uh, depending how we see the patients is, sometimes it's RCD is considered cyclophosphamide, dexamethasone, and rituximab. Uh, there are other new drugs coming. We still don't have access for uh, all of them, but we look sometimes always for our centers that if we have a clinical trial for those patients as well for uh, drugs they will tolerate, then we'll try to enroll. <coughs> now, what if the patient relapses after this treatment? Duration of remission is always a factor, okay? If patient had a treatment and then now has uh, many uh, years as compared to a patient who's just in a few months, 
relapses or they relapse during the maintenance. Luckily, in, in uh, lymph and lymphoma, is usually very uh, easy to treat. These most patients respond very well to treatment. Uh, but <clears throat> if patients has had a long period of remission, then I can consider uh, repeat uh, BR and also can consider the older therapies we had, like the RCHOP, RCVB. Always in our center, we had tried to advocate patients go into clinical trials on relapses. Now, also, how aggressive is the disease and how fast this patient relapsed uh, and how fit the patient is, we can consider other uh, line of modalities therapy is after getting those patients in remission again to talk about stem cell transplants. So we do auto-transplant sometimes patients who have a very aggressive disease or behave aggressively their disease. So other drugs, uh, protezion inhibitors, okay, they bortezomib or valcade, okay. So it's uh, basically this drug, it also, and we use it commonly and as a first line for multiple myeloma. As I mentioned here, those diseases have lots of similarities. It, did prove efficacy, and the regimen of bendamustin, rituximab, and dexamethasone, had lots of evidence on it, and it's used as well. <clears throat> we don't have access to it. However, if we have patients who are relapsed refractory patients, and we don't have an alternative, we don't have a clinical trial, we still as a group here go and try to get funding for this patient to go and, and proceed with this treatment. Now, we can also tailor patients based on if there is any other disease that, uh, or if there's evidence of minor doses for those patients, so we can tailor management. Minor doses, uh, we know it's uh, part of treatment is portismab, so for those patients who have minor doses, then we can tailor, we can get access to this drug and give it to those patients. So basically is that Yes, we have guidelines. Yes, we have indications uh, what to start first, what to start second. But always we have to look at the patient, okay? And these patients look at their age and if there are either health problems, their fitness, performance status, okay? <clears throat> and also the disease itself, how rapidly it is progressing, okay? How aggressively, as I mentioned, this disease is most of patients are easy to treat, but we encounter sometimes patients are very difficult, they're not responding easy. So do we shift from what we use and we get something, uh, other uh, things that's compassionate release? Yes, we do, okay? So here comes then a brutinib, okay? Uh, so a brutinib has been approved in Canada since April of 2016, and funding here in Nova Scotia is still pending, uh, and we get access to it by a compassionate uh, release, okay, and also via clinical trials. <clears throat> so who should use a brutinib, okay? Uh, patients who have had or failed previous therapies, okay? Uh, patients basically who are relapsing, uh, patients uh, have a rapidly flaring, progressing uh, disease as well. <clears throat> so I mentioned a long list of medications, okay, and mentioned what is what we are using here as a standard of care. Just a quick snap at the coverage here in Nova Scotia. Uh, we know that pharmacare is the uh, drug plan we have for patients and other group patients, uh, they have their private insurance plans. But I'll mention what Pharmacare give us access to. Uh, so Bendamustin, we do have access to it as a first line for uh, patients who have Walden's drone. <clears throat> Along with that, rituximab as well for during the induction of six months and then following that, the maintenance. Uh, then uh, other drugs, uh, Ofotumumab is not covered. And we had a study here, Optimumab uh, plus Bendamustin, which had, uh, for patients who were not responding well to the rituximab, right, because Ofotumumab is just a newer anti-CD20 antibody. So those patients, we had a study for them here and did not have, did have a negative uh, results. Now, afterward is the bortezomib, as I mentioned, uh, and here we don't have access to it. Uh, Carfilzin also showed uh, some evidence, but uh, 
we don't have access either to it. Now the uh, abrutinib, uh, it's approved in Canada here. However, we still do not have access to it. We uh, get it very easily, I would say, is nowadays as compassionate. And also we had a clinical trial. Uh, we had some patients on it. And we're looking to finding other clinical trials to open here in our center. <coughs> And I think soon will be coming, basically, for patients who is relapsed refractive. But as I highlighted, this, it's still easy for patients who need it. We can get it for those patients. Now, how, how this uh, coverage comes in play? We do have our tumor site group here and, and the hematology division here in Halifax. We do grand rounds uh, on, on a weekly basis, but we do tumor site grand round, which is we, if there's any hematological malignancy, we take this disease and we look at the, what are the updates, what are the treatments, what are the investigations that are new as well for this disease, review it all together as a, a group with the pathologists, uh, and basically afterward we proceed and submit if we see there's guidelines, and actually this drug now proves to be very beneficial for our patients, and we need to proceed ahead, so then we submit <coughs> our uh, request to the, uh, we'll call them people in downtown, but uh, the Department of Health, and we supply this to them and see, and negotiation there and goes on. <coughs> so, part of our division here, we do a lot of uh, uh, clinical trials, we participate in a lot of clinical trials, and wanted to pick one of the most recent trials we have participated on uh, for, uh, patients who have Waldenstrom, and the, uh, this trial basically looked at uh, patients who have Waldenstrom and treating them with uh, rotuximab and abrutinib compared to rotuximab alone. So uh, this trial was recruiting from 2014 and has closed, closed recruitment now. We have some patients on it. And the final results will be basically, should be in January 2019. Uh, so this trial, looking at those patients, saw in rotuximab plus abrutinib, which is a pill, daily you take it, and compared to other arm, which is our patients looking, taking rotuximab plus a uh, placebo, which is a, just a tablet to take, sugar pill, and see then uh, afterwards, see the results of these uh, patients. <coughs> uh, I think it would be very promising, and this is something that we will look at and help into negotiating further and um, the enrolling and covering abrutinib for our patients here. So in conclusion, um, the Waldenstrom treatment has changed significantly over the past decade even. I remember I, I was, when I was a first year fellow uh, back 2010, I did my uh, tumor site group grand round and was for Waldenstrom disease then, and I didn't have much to, to say. Uh, this was, we're talking RCD, uh, Clarem Bissell, our job, we're saying bindamustine is almost looming there. So things since then has changed dramatically, and I think they will keep evolving with the newer drugs also coming. Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you.